Good afternoon, YouTube. Uh, it's a relaxing Saturday afternoon, and I thought I would give another video, more of a narrative of my life and my experiences leaving the Jehovah Witness call. Thank you so much for all of your support and all of your comments. I always want to let all the people that send me comments and, you know, just give me reinforcement. I want them to know just how much it means to me. For a long time, when I first left, there wasn't an XJW community. Um, there wasn't a place for people like myself to go. So it's really amazing to see so many people coming together and sharing their stories. Um, many of you know the reasons why I don't show my face because of my profession. And a lot of people that have watched my videos, or if you're new, um, I've, I've spent a, many years in education, getting an education and going back and just learning. I like, I like knowledge. And I think as I rack my brain on some of the reasons that I love to read and I love love going to school is I think because I felt that I was so miseducated and I really really hated that my education was so controlled and so confining so when I was actually able to be in control of what I learned it was an amazing experience for me one of the things that really helped in my education was being around people that had a totally different outlook and experience in life than I did. I always tell people that as much as I liked going to institution of, of learning, I learned just as much from people that I just sat in a, a classroom and had like a group session of conversations and, and stories and people giving experiences off of the different subjects that we discussed. With that in mind, um, today's topic is about my time when I was actually interviewed uh, for a radio show that was discussing people that had left cults. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how that even happened. Um, it actually was a catalyst after my world religion class I took was over. I kept in touch with some of the people that I had taken the class with. Uh, we shared stories of what motivated us to take this graduate course and, you know, some of our stories of being in certain religions and groups. And one of the people that had taken the course was... Um, going to be a counselor um, for people that were leaving cults. And as part of that requirement, they had to take uh, a pretty intensive world religion course and go through um, many different types of study just to understand what people that are in sort of dogmatic religions and conservative groups and cults um, deal with. So I <clears throat> received an email from this person and they said that they had started um, interacting with a group of people that wanted to share their stories about their experiences in a cult. And this person, and I have to kind of be careful how I give this information because I want to protect these people's identities. Um, uh, some of the people that I talked to were anonymous, but this person who was organizing this um, asked if I wanted to be a part of a conversation. There were a few conversations that we were to have before we went on the radio and then one when we were actually going to be on the radio and be interviewed. Um, so <clears throat> I had actually had a few communications with this person 
talking about my own experience as a Jehovah Witness and some of the things that I had experienced from my family members after I left, um, some of the things that I've talked about and some of the other videos that I've done and how it affected my life and just having a dysfunctional family that I think being in a cult, it exasperated um, a lot of the things that were already going on and it made it much worse. Um, so I think that having had a chance to get away from it for a while and realize that it doesn't, you, you don't just leave the Jehovah Witness uh, cult and then everything's great. I don't care if your whole family leaves. If you've been a part of this cult for the majority of your life, it affects you. I don't think it ever totally leaves your psyche. I think you make peace with it. But I think that even now, I've not, I've, I've been out of this cult for many, many years. But there's still things that I think I'm, I'm a bit conservative about certain subjects. I mean, even when I realized that I'm being conservative because of the way that I was raised, um, I still realized that there are certain ideas that I have that were definitely conditioned by the way in which I lived. And that was a process for me because I went from one extreme to the other. So I lived very conservatively. There was a time for a bit when I was the other extreme where I was like, no rules and do everything the way I want to do it. And then I had to find a happy balance so that I wasn't going out there and actually doing something that was just a reaction to being in a repressive, a repressive cult. And that takes a very long time to undo. So I was going through that at that time and and I you know really enjoyed talking to this person and you know having some other people that were in our class that had similar backgrounds and kind of understood what I was going through so I kind of kept in touch with this person they reached out to me and told me that you know they had a group of people that were survivors of different cults and wanted to kind of get together have a few few conversations and then be interviewed for this radio program. And I was I was really good with it. I love talking to different types of people. I love hearing different experiences that people have because from and and I said this in one of my my earlier videos, um I really hate the fact that when I was in the Jehovah Witness cult that I allowed them to tell me about other groups of people and what they thought and what they believed. And I always say, even for me, don't take my word for anything. Find out for yourself. Use your own critical thinking and knowledge. The world is a very big place. And there are people from all different backgrounds and all different uh, ethnicities and cultures and subcultures. And... The only way that you're actually going to find out about those people is actually if you know them and you talk to them and you communicate with them. The Jehovah Witness cult is a very closed group and they try to control their members through fear and intimidation. And what happens is that they try to force you to only listen to their interpretation of the world and fear you from actually stepping out of that and looking at what other people say. And, uh, you know, I'm a philosopher, I've been a philosopher for a long time. And I really believe that there's certain truths that don't change. It should be, if it's, a, if it's true, it should be able to be examined. You shouldn't be afraid of your truth being examined by any number of, of places and you shouldn't it, it shouldn't make a difference if you're in the context of the Jehovah Witness cult or you're in the context of a Catholic church or a Muslim church or whatever if they all teach that God is love 
Should it matter? God isn't a religion. Jesus came, if you're Christian, to, to take you away from the context of being in a certain religion. So freedom of choice and freedom of exploration to, to explore the truths of the world, the philosophies of the world, is a human right. <laughs> and when I was able to talk to people from all different walks of life, it was actually mind-blowing. A lot of the theoretical information that I received in my education was validated by my actual interactions with people from different walks of life. So the group that I actually had a chance to talk to, they were, um, they were from uh, Quakers, some people that had left the, the Quaker religion, um, Hasidics, Hasidic Jewish people. There was quite a few Hasidic Jewish people and I found their stories probably some of the most fascinating. There was one person that was an ex-Scientologist and I and some few other, other groups. I, I wanna keep some of it, again, generic because I want to respect um, the people's privacy. And so some of what I'm telling you is not 100% because even with the people that I was talking to, they changed their names and they, they f fudged a few things because they were still working out how they were going to actually leave their, their, their groups. And my heart went out to them because I was the only one that was actually representing the ex Jehovah Witnesses, there was another person who wanted to come and be a part of the group, but chickened out because they were really concerned that somebody might find out who they were. And I totally understand that. What do cults have in common? What do what was what was the like the consensus of the group when we were sharing our stories? All of the people that were in the group that, that I was a part of had shunning as a part of their experiences, which was really, really fascinating to me. Um, I don't know why I thought that Jehovah Witnesses were the only ones that do shunning and do excommunication. But again, once I took world religion and, and then heard how severe some of these people's experiences were, and they were just basically the same thing. I'm like, I don't talk to the majority of my family. Like my my aunt, I saw my aunt literally maybe two feet from me and she absolutely ignored me. Like she would not even acknowledge that she saw me. And it was shocking to me. I mean, I, I can understand maybe people that were in the congregation but even though I intellectually knew that once I left this religion that I was going to be shunned, having it happen to me, it was very painful. It was it was very it was very shocking to me. The the the, the act of being ignored by someone that is my family and that I love hurt me. And I had to get to a place where it wouldn't hurt me. And I, I told, you know, I shared my story on, you know, how I actually have written these letters to each and one of my family. And the it was the people in my immediate family that I had written a, a letter to. And it was really interesting as I told this story, um, how I, I had planned my escape down to a few different things coming into place, which didn't happen. Um, I had gotten a large sum of money. I had planned to get a place to live, but I was so young that I could not, I could not get anyone to uh, rent me or even, I couldn't even buy anything because I was so young and I needed a co-signer. So I didn't, I wasn't able to, to leave in the manner in which I wanted to leave. And because of that, I wasn't able to send out these letters <laughs> that I wanted to. It, it actually took me 
about a year and a half to actually get my father to co-sign on an apartment. And then I was able to move out and be on my own and, and, and sort of not have to deal with my family members at all. But at the time that I left, I would say, and I'm, I love percentages because I love math um, and probability statistics and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to say probably 95% of my family I was not interacting with at the time that I faded away first. And then I was disfellowshipped because I refused to come back to the Kingdom Hall. Um, I went to confess about something, but they told me to my face that they didn't want to disfellowship me for that. As I think about it now, I think that the reason why they didn't want to disfellowship me for that is because of the ranking that my grandfather had in the congregation. And, and, and again, you know, as I've mentioned in other videos, this is a service-oriented uh, religion. <clears throat> so they actually had my service record in front of me <laughs> when we were having this conversation. But... Um, I totally did not like the judicial meeting and I decided that I was not going to go back and they wanted me to start committing to coming back to the Kingdom Hall and they basically told me, you know, literally you seem very sorry, um, we'd just like to put you on reproof, but we need you to commit to coming back to the Kingdom Hall and I just wouldn't do it and I would not return their phone calls. And, you know, as I was telling this story, I saw the Hasidic Jews nodding, the Quakers, you know, sort of nodding. Theirs is a, a bit different, but it was really interesting to me how many similarities that the person from Scientology and the Hasidic Jews had with what I had went through. Um, I also talked about how when my... When I when I told my grandmother, my 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 heart, I loved my grandmother so much. I was closer to my my maternal grandmother than my own mother. And when I told her that I was leaving, how she attacked me, like she physically attacked me. And I only been hit by my grandmother one other time when I was like four years old, and I remembered it. You know, like it really. And, and they said, were you hurt? And I was like, I think I was, it was, you know, like talking about it, I said, in on the one hand, it really hit me how much my grandmother loved me, but it, it was so painful to me. It was like one of those aha moments. Like my grandmother is so conditioned to this cult that she, she thinks me leaving the the religion means that I'm leaving her, that they've gotten her so mind controlled that she thinks that because I say, I don't want to be a part of this religion, I have to leave, that I'm going out into the world and I'm going to just, you know, be this terrible person and that I'm not going to have things. And I'm like, <laughs> that's, that's like as, as far from the truth as it could possibly be, um, you know, not to talk in terms of numbers and success and levels of education and the, you know, salary that I make. I'm like, I actually think I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> and I don't I don't think I had to uh, I don't feel like I had to give up anything. I didn't have to. I didn't have to, to pretend that I was someone else. I didn't have to have a group of people telling me what to think and what to believe. And so the Hasidic Jews started talking about their own experiences. And they, you know, were sharing, you know, it was two of them. They were actually cousins. And, you know, they both decided that they wanted to leave. And they talked about how they were actually attacked by their family members and they were like, they tossed books or something at them as they packed up their stuff and, and were leaving. What I found fascinating, cause we were, you know, all just basically sharing. 
And what I found fascinating and also with Scientology, and that's when I, this is actually the first time that I've actually ever had a conversation with someone that was a Scientologist. When it comes to the African-American community and the Hispanic community, Scientology is not, does not have a huge imprint, especially when I was growing up. Scientology really looks for uh, Caucasians and people that have a lot of money. Um, so I never, I never saw a Scientologist. I, I remember uh, being downtown in my city and seeing people asking if you wanted a free personality test. I, I do remember the L. Ron Hubbard books infomercials that would come up about Dianetics. But in terms of my life, I did not come across Scientologists. Even in, in college, I would not come across Scientologists. I have seen people that were Jewish, not Hasidic Jews, because Hasidic Jewish people are a sect even outside of Judaism. And some of their practices are very, very similar to the Jehovah Witnesses along with Scientology. It's actually very, very interesting. So some of the things that we found out that we have in common, um, the early childhood marriages. Um, my, my parents, my mother and father were married when they were 18 years old. And my mother and father have actually known each other most, if not all of their lives. My grandparents on both sides were best friends. And my mother and father have always known each other. And because of the dysfunction that both of them were feeling in their homes, they got married young. The cousins were people that walked away from their own marriages and they got married at 17 and 18 years old. They really didn't have much choice in it. That was different from Jehovah Witnesses. Quaker and Scientology each had their own version of basically the same thing. Scientology, not so much about the marriages though, but the Quakers, the Hasidic Jews, and the Jehovah Witnesses each had a high incidence of early childhood marriages. And so I, again, I was the person that was speaking about the Jehovah, Jehovah Witness uh, reasoning behind it and motivation behind it. So we're taught not to have sex before marriage. If you start having those feelings that you're supposed to pursue a marriage. So I, I told them my experience is that Jehovah Witnesses also have a high rate of divorce, a high rate of spousal abuse, because you don't know yourself when you're 18 years old. You have not matured. And although I know people that have gotten married young, and I said, even though my grandparents on both sides were not in that religion they both got both of my grandmothers got married before they were 21 i'm going to say before they were 20 <clears throat> and my mother at 18 so to me i've i I've, I've seen the effects of that i remember my grandmother made a statement to me my maternal grandmother she said you know it took me 30 years to love your grandfather and at the time, I thought she was just telling me some old school information. But as she started saying other things to me, and then I found out what was going on in my family, I was, you know, again, because I'm from a different generation. My first question was, why would you marry somebody you didn't love? And why why would you be with someone if it took you 30 years to love that person? Like, that, that doesn't even make sense. But now that I'm older and wiser and, and studied and can look at things from a whole lot of different perspectives, I, I get what she was trying to tell me, even if she wasn't articulating it definitively. And 
listening to the Hasidic, you know, Jews and the Quakers telling me their stories, I was like, wow, wow, this is amazing. And I think, and again, that's that group dynamics of learning from people who are different from you, but have similar stories about what you have experienced. I remember, you know, they were saying that, you know, like when I was talking about my aunt and this, this person was sharing how their parents, their grandparents walked by them and would not even acknowledge them. And you could see the tears and hurt in this person's eyes and in their body. And I was like, you know, I, I don't understand how, how you can justify that. Like, what have you done? You just said that you don't want to be a part of a belief system. And I'm just like, people don't understand that what it's like when you're on the outside. Because the purpose of this group was surviving and finding ways of coping with coming from a high controlled group and actually trying to find yourself and make peace with yourself. And that's the hard part because I lost my support system. Before I left the cult that I was in, the only friends and family I had was Jehovah Witnesses. And you know, that's why I did the video about how working at Sears actually changed my life. When I started planning my exit, I realized that the first thing I had to do was to replace the support system and family structure that I was leaving and having something that I could go to. And even with everything that I plan, because there's only so much you can plan and then life steps in and you can't control things that are, are out of your control. And, and life is just so unpredictable and things didn't happen the way that I wanted it to. I'm still glad that I had those plans in place because even with everything not going the way that I thought it would go, at some point I was able to go back to that plan. Even if I wasn't able to implement it in the way that I wanted, at some point I was able to go back and and live and, and take those steps. But mentally and emotionally, I had already known what I had to do. And, and I think self-preparation, and we use it like a hurricane. There's nothing that's going to save you from what happens when a hurricane hits. But being prepared and, and doing everything that you can to minimize the damage makes a big difference. It, it really makes a difference. And I think, like I said, when I you know was giving my own testimony and my own testament of the things that I had to go through and the things that still stay with me, because there's once in a while, I wanna call a cousin and I'll say, do you remember when we were together and we were, we had that funny story or, you know, remember when blah, blah, blah. And I realized that I can't. When, when I when I think about, oh, I, I just wanna see my aunt's face or my uncle's face. I just wanna, because these are my, this is my family. These are people that I've known my whole life. You know, and some, some of my uh, Jehovah Witness family is very nasty to me and very mean to me. And I know it's in the context of the religion because I think in, in, in the Hasidic Jews were like, we totally understand because I don't really talk to them. Like I knew when I left that I wasn't going to have any interaction with them, but, but at funerals and, and I made the decision that I, I won't go to anymore, but I wasn't going to not go to my mother's funeral. I wasn't going to not go to my, you know, like those are things that I am going to go to and they will show up. My parents were Jehovah Witnesses. My father's still alive until their dying day. So when my mother died and I went to my mother's funeral, 
my family was there. I was going to be there because that's my mother. And I saw different people that were still in the Jehovah Witness cult that were my family members. And some of them spoke and some of them didn't. And some of them were nice and some of them weren't. And I didn't really care either way, but it was just really interesting to me because it's baseline. <laughs> I've not had any interaction with you. What, what could you possibly be holding on to other than I was, I left the cult and it has mind controlled you to mistreat me or to talk negatively about me. It's abuse. And it's being taught by this cult. And, you know, the Hasidic Jews were telling me some of the same things that they that they went through. I mean, like walking down the street. Because a lot of them, even when they leave, they're still going to be in a surrounding neighborhood. And coming up on people that were their cousins or people that were their family members. And hearing them say things in Yiddish that were insults and, 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 and calling them out and even throwing things at them. And I'm like, see, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you, you kind of think your story is significant or bad until you hear how other people are going through. And Quakers are basically the same things. And Scientology, the Scientology was, it, it was it was never a competition of who has the worst story, but Scientology, <laughs> when, when the person started sharing some of the things that they went through in Scientology, I was completely flabbergasted because I'd never heard anything about this group before. I really didn't know that they did things like that. And I was completely stunned. So they take shunning to a whole nother level where they actually harass you and they actually, I mean, they, they don't talk to you, but they harass you. Like they'll go, if you speak out and th that person was deep, deep undercover. And I'm not going to say if this was a male or a female or give any other information about this person, but the things that they do when they find out that you're speaking out against their group is scary. It's very scary. And, and I don't want to say too much other than watch the Leah Remy Scientology series. I think a lot of her conversations remind me of the times that I actually sat with people that were from different cults even though she's only focusing on Scientology, if she changed that format up, and I've heard, <clears throat> I've heard conversations um, from my extended community that there's a chance that she's going to start talking to people from other cults that have had similar backgrounds, and I think it would, I think it would be phenomenal. I'd love for her to talk about the Jehovah Witnesses. I, I would love for her to start talking to us. Um, I think again, like the Quakers and sort of like the Hasidic Jews, I think Jehovah Witnesses definitely have a persona of peaceful and calm. And that's, to me, that's the step for persona. That's, 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 that's their manner in which they deceive you. I, you know, I don't think, and I, I've said this before in, in, in some of my earlier videos, the the people that I know that were Jehovah Witnesses, the people that I went to the congregations, I don't think they're bad people. I think they're misguided people. I think that they are mind controlled people. I don't think that they get up believing that they're, they're, they're believing or they're a part of something that's wrong. I think the only criticism that I ever have is that when you have facts in front of you that you continue to deny them. So there have been so many instances where you have, I've had, I've seen other people that have presented Jehovah's Witnesses with facts and they lie. 
I mean, facts with their own with their own publications, with their own watchtowers, with their own statements on JW Org. Um, no, you've actually taken that out of context. And I'm like, oh, so you mean the way that Jehovah Witnesses take scriptures out of context? <laughs> I mean, anybody can move around the Bible and use one scripture from Genesis and then one scripture from Revelation to support something. If you're not reading it in the context of the way that it was actually written or who was the audience that was writing it, writing it to and for, then you really haven't made a point. So when you do that with them, they want to say you've taken that completely out of context. So to me, it's kind of kind of like sharing information with people that have had the similar situations happen to them. And, you know, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time. I just wanted to kind of share with people that this is not just about being an ex-Jehovah Witness. This is about leaving a highly controlled group and finding your own persona. And it's, it's a process. It's a grieving process. I, I've literally talked about people that I know that I still don't feel have completely recovered from leaving the cult. I still say people have They've not gone, They're, they don't attend, but they still have a lot of the same mind mindset and then a lot of the same beliefs. And I think that's why it's important to, you know, do, do the full, you know, to use from, you know, NA and A, do the, do the full steps, do the full 12 steps. And I'm not saying you need 12 steps. I'm saying you have to allow yourself to completely move from one from one stage to another and don't get stuck because when you get stuck it it holds you back and and I've just seen that time and time again where you're still not sure what you think and what you believe and you still are unclear about yourself and how you feel about yourself and that's why I've seen people that um, they, they, they're not acknowledging how they feel and they, they haven't acknowledged how they felt when they have been rejected and when they've been, um, labeled. And, and, and that was really, you know, so when I talk to people and they're like, why do you, how are you so grounded at this point in your life? It was a process. It was a process for me. I It wasn't perfect. I went through, you know, again, I went through being unhappy. I, I went through being angry. I went through those things, but I actually allowed myself to have those feelings, but I never, I never allowed them to contaminate me to the point where I didn't move on. And I loved, loved that I was able to, to be a part of this radio broadcast, that I was actually able to talk with people that came from different backgrounds and different cults, and that we got to share a lot of our, a lot of our experiences because it was when, when you, when you talk to people that can understand what you're, what you've been through and what you've experienced and, and how that made you feel, it empowers you. It makes you realize I'm actually not alone. When you can talk to people and you can see that they, they actually survived leaving a cult. They survived being cut off from their family. They survived not knowing where they was, where they were going to go next. They survived those things. And here's some of the things that they actually did in order for that to happen. And so we each had a different story, but in the same way, we were all talking about the enlightenment process. And that's a, that's a fundamental truth that doesn't matter who you are. As long as you keep walking forward, it will happen. And so I, I walked away from that experience 
wanting to know more about these groups and understanding a little bit more about their backgrounds. So I had went back to some of my research that I had done in my graduate course. And then I actually did some research just outside of even that because I just found it completely fascinating. I remember after all of this, I had actually had a few more exchanges with one of the Hasidic, um, the people that were a part of this group. And one thing that he, he had mentioned to me, he or she had mentioned to me, was that in the Hasidic culture, they don't want them to learn math and science. And I found that extremely fascinating. And I was like, that is really, really interesting. And I said, well, it's really interesting because in the Jehovah Witness cult, they really don't want you to get a higher education. So then I asked this person about the rabbis, about the people that actually like rule their religion or the people that are considered to be seers and people that actually have a very high level of regard. And I say, well, do they know math and science? And they're, well, they're, and he, he or she would say that it's, they have to learn everything so they can instruct their members. And I found that really, really fascinating because again, I'm like, I, this is one of the first times I wonder what the education requirements are for the governing body and people that actually rule the Jehovah Witness cult. I've actually never asked the question. And, and that's when I started realizing, wait a minute, this is probably one of the reasons that a lot of the information that the governing body gives out seems very uneducated and antiquated and doesn't make sense. And, you know, again, we were just having that, that sort of conversation, which is like brainstorming and having those aha moments, but it doesn't happen unless you're sort of talking with people and sharing stories. So why did I make this video? I made this video because I wanted to share my story. But the other reason I made the video is because I wanted to tell people, it's great that you listen to the YouTube videos. Maybe it's out of curiosity, maybe because you're thinking about leaving the religion, maybe because you're in a cult and you want to hear other people's experiences. But, and this is a question for each person that's listening. What are you going to do? What are you going to do in your life now that the light bulb has gone off? Because you can't go back to where you were yesterday. The more that you open your mind, the more that you listen to people that don't think like you, because everyone is not going to think the way you think. And actually, that's okay. There's still a place for you to find a common bond, a common thread, because we still all have to exist together. But what we can't do is be intolerant of our differences. Thank you so much for listening to my story, my narrative about having a radio interview about cults. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and I'll talk to you soon.